pandemic for this, COVID-19 both caused and exposed political and institu institutional fragility around the world. So for business, here are some of the symptoms to look for. A prolonged pandemic, believe that box has been ticked. Persistent inflation, tightening liquidity, volatile energy markets, irregular migration flows. And you'll see the manifestations of this state instability in things like extreme poverty, food insecurity, armed conflict, political instability, population, dis population displacement, and youth unemployment. The security issues emerging from an increased number of fragile states belongs to a category we call urgent risks or emerging risks. Things to anticipate that may not have yet materialized. So what do we do? Be prepared for potential triggers, domestic or global, that might result in rapid and significant change in the security environment, even in countries with relatively stable governments. Understand how state fragility can spill over borders and affect entire regions. In some cases, that will mean spending time understanding risks in countries where you do not operate as a material risk to your operations, perhaps across the nearby border. Finally, we're telling companies to plan for increased disruption and security risks in developed economies, which are experiencing higher rates of social fragility, political violence, and in some cases, radical, radicalized act act activism. So elections, major economic corrections, as well as other high profile criminal corruption and police brutality incidents can all trigger a rapid escalation of political violence. So moving from security and fragility, next we come to terrorism, <clears throat> a heavily discussed topic among security and intelligence professionals, given the current global reconceptualization. I'd like to share with you our thinking on how COVID-19 and the Taliban will shape terrorism for years to come. The intelligence community has changed the definition of terrorism to focus better on the fight against the threat of homegrown terrorism. There was a concern that too much emphasis had been put on Islamic extremism and that they had under allocated resources to domestic threats. Everything from right and left wing groups to conspiracy theory and identity motivated violent extremism. The shift in focus came from a realization that in the data, there was more significant incidences arising out of these groups than there were Islamists. We've also seen many examples of this conducted by a devotee of race replacement theories. What has led to is a much more complex lexicon of terrorism, starting with the shift from terrorism to violent extremism as the umbrella term. And the other terminology changes from country to country, but all basically seek to differentiate from those who are primarily driven by an international religious-based agenda, and those driven by more domestic or even personal issues. Having established the landscape is in flux, terrorism today and beyond will be shaped by two major developments, the pandemic and the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. These two developments post different kinds of threats, but both are contributing to an increasing diverse risk landscape. The COVID pandemic has transformed the terrorism landscape in a number of ways worldwide. It wrought enormous economic, economic damage and social disruption, and when combined, form key drivers of the grievances and divisions that stimulate conflict, terrorism, and violent extremism. The pandemic distracted and detracted from counter-terrorism counter efforts. Political attention during the pandemic flowed away from counter-terrorism efforts and towards pandemic response. And all of this took place against a backdrop of aggravated mental health, financial relationship and other personal stresses that make people more susceptible to radicalization and exploitation by terrorist recruiters. 
as we were all forced inside to our homes and onto the internet to find connection with people and others. Many recent attacks have been attributed to frequency of radical sites, chat rooms, and other things on, online during the pandemic. Inequity, marginalization, social disconnection are the drivers of a social undertone, unhappy with life's opportunities and thus a pretext for violence. So turning to Afghanistan, the cracks are already clear in the Taliban's ability to maintain a civil society. The Taliban itself is factional and decentralized. It does not have a kind of command and control structure that would allow it to grasp everything that's happening across its borders. Afghanistan is now a safer place for a wide variety of terrorist groups than it was when the US was patrolling it with drones and special forces. However, religiously motivated terrorism is no longer the existential threat to organizations in the way that it was perceived in the immediate post 9 11 era. It is ideologically motivated extremism, which I believe has a more immediate vulnerability. We see and have seen terrorist threats coming out of niche online movements, anti-government, sovereign citizen groups, anti-capitalist, environmental and political activism, which can all move to radicalization quite quickly. On the plus side, they are easier to disrupt and businesses should always be looking to review and strengthen their threat assessments, security zoning and response, access control and insider threat programs. Make sure you understand the threats in a sophisticated way. What logical targets are you close to? What is the exposure for your hybrid workforce? And the new working environment that we find ourselves in, sometimes the kitchen bench. So with that, I'll move from terrorism onto cyber. And I'm determined to stay high level here in the morning and not round you out with complicated cyber talk. There's no doubt that cyber risk has become a more pressing concern for businesses worldwide as technology update has uptake has rapidly increased in the workplace. Spurred on by further, spurred on further by unique challenges of COVID-19. An organization's ability to operate in the last three years has become almost entirely dependent on the availability, security, and their IT functions and services. What does the global threat landscape look like? First and foremost, governments are failing to deter aggressive behavior. As offensive cyber capabilities proliferate amongst a rising, amongst a rising number of state and non-state actors. We've seen some efforts by the US to set red lines on what cyber attacks should be used, sort of Geneva Convention of Cyber, but it's no avail. In the absence of red lines, it feels like we're really rushing towards mutual destruction. More states are looking to expand their offensive capabilities, meaning that the private sector is left to defend for itself and leapfrog ahead where domestic defensive capabilities are lacking. Highly capable state actors will deploy their cyber offensive technologies offered to their allies and their proxies. And we've observed state actors arm their allies and proxies with fully fledged cyber weapons designed to disrupt operations and steal large volumes of sensitive data. Some have been designed by commercial entities. The most famous example of this was the Pegasus spyware developed by the Israeli firm NSO Group. This proliferation among a growing number of threat actors is adding to the challenge of accurately attributing incidences to real world actors. But does that even matter? The line between state and criminal actor isn't so clear. There's a rapidly advancing trend of collaboration between states and cyber criminals in a growing number of ways states are leveraging their homegrown cyber criminal talent. Let's take a minute to reflect on these cyber criminal groups 
So yeah, they're not teenagers in basements. They have office suites, rooms, profitability models. This is, another, this is old news in countries like Russia, Iran, and North Korea, who have engaged directly in criminality or have collaborated with domestic cyber criminals for years. Their success, both politically and financially, has emboldened other states to develop these partnerships, in turn driving an virtuous cycle of state sponsorship. While domestic cases of data theft and ransomware have drastically reduced inside their own countries, cases of data theft and ransomware have propagated at an exponential rate outside their countries. A large number of cyber attacks and malicious activity was reported by organizations operating in the Ukraine, beginning of the conflict with Russia. And the aim of such attacks was certainly used to disrupt infrastructure, such as telecoms, emergency services, and energy production, all supplementary, supplementing military aims. And it's almost certain that the series of disruptive operations was designed to coincide with the invasion using a malicious wiper malware targeting hundreds of machines across Ukraine to erase data from government devices and NGO devices. In reply, a similar mal malware, wiper malware, was observed to affect organizations in other nations like Belarus, connections to the Ukraine. And during the first week of the invasion, the notorious ransomware group Conti provided a demonstration of the group's close affiliation with the Russian state. And it's long been well known that prominent global ransomware actors like Conti and Rebel <coughs> were able to operate out of Russia by ensuring that they did not target CIS states. In the longer term, we see both cyber criminal and activist targeting patterns increasing to align with the geopolitical rivalries of actors and their host states. And this will allow such criminals and activists to avoid retribution. But cyber diplomacy is not just about the protection of cyber attacks today. Equally important and contentious is defining the rules of the game in the future. The competition to control the parameters for technology will continue and competing visions for technology will be used to justify restrictive regulation, online repression, surveillance, and the disruption, all under the umbrella of digital and cyber sovereignty. Controlling the online space will become increasingly important for states seeking to repress voices, in particular during times of election and social tensions, which has already triggered longer and more disruptive internet, internet shutdowns globally. Chinese leader Xi Jinping summed up growing, rapidly growing concerns of digital policymakers in his 2018 speech. Without cybersecurity, there is no national security. So this will be a challenge, and this will challenge the foundations of internet governance, the way that global organizations do business. All right. <laughs> Moving on to reputational risks and the acronym du jour, ESG, Environment, Social and Governance Risks. Organisations are under pressure to intensify their activities on climate, climate leadership and responsible citizenship. Both as governments cascade ESG commitments to the private sector and in places where governments aren't yet active, people look to the private sector to fill a void. The next 36 months will be critical to take a decision that enable you to adapt and thrive in the long term. And that means three things. Hyperinvestment in ESG activities, measuring impact, not just policies, and not losing sight of the S, social, and the G, governance, alongside the headlining grabbing climate risk. So my colleague, Corey Davey, is going to take a deeper look at ESG risk in a moment. She's my boss, so not to steal the thunder. <laughs> I'm going to move to the next risk. Geopolitics. It's back. Front and center on risk registers. Did it ever really go away? 
the United States, China, Russia, and the EU are redefining not just what they stand for, but where and how they stand for it. The rest of the world is nervously watching. A great transition has begun towards a new global geopolitical order. We don't yet know what the order will look like or which countries will design its architecture. In the case of geopolitics, we feel it's the transition itself that's the risk. We're saying goodbye to a US-led geopolitical comfort zone. The US is currently racking up a number of domestic concerns. It's split between various flashpoints globally and has repeatedly been unhinged by its own domestic politics. Well, as external circumstances, the Middle East and wars, Russia's invasion on the Ukraine, coupled with its attempts to shift its military, commercial, and diplomatic resources to Asia. Without the US as the author of the global's terms and conditions, there's an alternative geopolitical order that is a number of important risks, including failed states, weak rule of international law and norms, and renewed tension in international response. Or would, a, or would a new world order more adequately represent voices of developing countries, rising powers? These are the questions underlying the gradual evolution of global homogeneity. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of energy transition, accelerated by reduced gas supplies, rapid digitalization, supply chain decoupling, all of which are disruptive processes themselves. Well, I'll make some comments on energy, technology, and supply chains in the context of geopolitics in a moment. For now, I want to talk a little bit on the US-China relationship. The global survey conducted by Control Risks at the beginning of 22 revealed that 65% of respondents said that they were re-evaluating their long-term strategy in response to changes in the geopolitical environment. That was before Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. What is specifically the concern? Many people that we speak to are worried about the rise of China and the possibility that they will become the leader of the new global order. They'll rewrite geopolitical priorities. We believe this is exaggerated and oversimplified. We certainly hear the headlines. The democracy is being eroded by the control of information and it's impacting social cohesion. But history will show this is not a new concept. Let's be clear, the US isn't about to fall off a cliff. Although we sometimes gasp at what's happening over there, it's not likely that they're about to pass the relay back on. In 2022, the US alliance structure is stronger than it has ever been because of the Russia Ukraine war. And despite inflation, the US economy is robust, resilient, and has future prospects. But it also lacks a clear foreign policy goal that is defined beyond competition with China. Many worry that such a narrow scope will increase instability and the cycle for tit for tat competition. As China and other non traditional US countries rise economically and militarily, it is natural that these countries will command stronger influence in situations around the world. That's not to say that any <coughs> new order will be China led. But what would a shared world order look like? we see two plausible scenarios. One is a less hawkish view of China's rise, more of an evolving world order, where the US and China can cooperate on global issues and middle countries not left having to choose sides. The countries clearly define the boundaries of competition, but cooperate on issues like climate and the international trade of narcotics. The second is less positive, fractured, defined by power sharing arrangements and marked by instability. 
both the US and China compete for, for influence globally, leaving countries and companies with zero sum choice, both flouting their political systems as the beacon for world order, sustained economic growth, and social cohesion. But unfortunately, both the US and China suffer a bad case, case of exceptionalism. The future is anything but certain. So how does China and the US potentially get to the two scenarios I just described? On the China side, they would probably need to understand US motivations. It's not just about containing China's rise, there are actual legitimate concerns with what China is doing domestically and abroad. And on the US side, they need to accept that China will inevitably be a bigger contributor to global affairs and recognize that in many cases, China will not be able to change something. <laughs> the US therefore needs to reform some of its own system to ensure it can effectively compete with China. What seems likely is that in the coming decade, China as a rising power will continue to protect its power overseas through economic, diplomatic, and military means. Something that it's had mixed success with to date. It will continually try to get a bigger piece of the pie and the US in response will continue to pursue its containment and roundup of support. So for businesses, we recommend close monitoring of geopolitical movements, one of which I'll speak a little bit more in a moment, Taiwan. But before I do, I wanna speak briefly about the geopolitics of energy. At the intersection of climate, security and energy, Supply and demand is currently center stage. As nations scramble to get off Russian gas, many economies are still utterly dependent on coal and gas-fired coal power generation. Fossil fuel still powers the world's transport system and its modern militaries. And as countries transition away the violent conflicts and geopolitical competition that has been woven into the global arena for many decades does not look to be slowing down just because of the move to green energy. Across the globe, the transition to renewables occurs at a massive and uneven scale, and green energy still has nations rushing to dig holes, secure mining licenses, and supply chains as access to critical minerals to power batteries, build solar panels, and conduct hydrothermal and wind energy systems is well underway. The race to secure cobalt, copper, lithium, nickel, and a whole range of metals I can't pronounce, demonstrates that energy politics will continue to be a feature of the international landscape, deeply entwined with almost every major decision facing leaders, and a robust understanding of the issues will be more important than ever. <coughs> Politics and its relationship with technology is well spoken about. Race to AI and blockchain, semiconductors, microchips, and quantum computing supremacy. So, picking one of the international strategic competitions, most notably between the US and China, is 6G wireless telecommunication. Now, 6G promises superior data transfer speeds, potentially really reaching one terabit per second. And those enhancements will obviously supercharge economic performance and military capabilities. In fact, 6G will directly impact the international balance of military capabilities. For example, one of 6G's expected military uses is the rapid, reliable and secure transmission much higher volumes of data between fast moving military platforms, including in outer space for ballistic missile learning warning systems. The technology is driving both international cooperation, but also competition, reflected by competing visions of digital global order and will remain at the heart of geopolitics, shaping global alignments and engagements Now, it's pretty hard to talk about energy and technology and geopolitics without talking a little bit about supply chains. And looking back over the past decades, 
the period of hyper-globalization is certainly taking a few knocks. Whereas previously, the leading question being asked was, where is the cheapest or most efficient to buy and produce? Rising geopolitical tensions are shifting the question to where is the safest to produce and buy? Or even, should we be trading with nations that we perceive as a threat? National security conservatives will have you believe that globalization meant that Western democracies naively sponsored the rise of hostile violence. Whereas left-wing critics associate the neoliberal era of globalization with widening inequality and the destruction of our environment. The rise of protectionism and the development of legislation, regulation to reduce economic dependence from other nations is attempting to decouple from intricate <coughs> cross-border supply chains that have been built up over decades. This takes time. Sudden shocks such as the pandemic and the Ukraine-Russia conflict have shown our global supply chains are increasingly vulnerable. A bipartisan consensus in the US is now pushing for policies to reduce economic dependence on China and to repatriate key industries. China itself is an active participant in the process of decoupling, and in line with their Made in China 2025 strategy, it aims to increase Chinese domestic content of core materials to 70% by 2025. And with the majority of the world's semiconductors made and produced not only in a single location, but by a single company, used in everything from mobile phones to cars to missiles, understandable that Taiwan is a location of interest. Now let's talk a little bit about Taiwan and perhaps leave the other flashpoint, Ukraine, Russia, to some of the other speakers following today, all the Q&A sessions. <laughs> Long-term risks regarding Taiwan have risen in recent years. Leaders in Beijing have expressed growing frustration over Taiwan while the cross-strait military balance has moved steadily in Beijing's favor. US commitment to Taiwan is increasingly questioned and prospects for peaceful unification appear increasingly remote, particularly after China's crackdown on political opposition in Hong Kong. A new higher threshold for tension has been set after Pelosi's visit to Taipei this month, which Beijing considered a major provocation and responded with unprecedented military exercises around the island. China's most significant show of force in the region ever. As well as selective import and export restrictions Beijing put on Taiwanese industries, they also targeted, targeted a number of Taiwanese companies. But we control risks believe that the risk of war in Taiwan or over Taiwan remains low. China is highly unlikely to attempt forcible unification with Taiwan in the absence of a very strong <coughs> trigger or pretext. Taiwan and the US are currently unlikely to provide such a trigger, although the risk of actions that Beijing considers a major provocation is rising, with the outlook a little bit more uncertain beyond 2024 due to the elections in Taiwan, also the elections in the US. And compared to Russia's Ukraine options, China has much less scope and ability for engineering pretexts with false flag operations. It lacks a land border or allies in Taiwan that are equivalent to pro-Russian armed groups <coughs> in different parts of the Ukraine. So we see two key triggers for escalation do exist. One, a major clear red line is crossed and a provocation by the US and Taiwan. This is getting more plausible amid Washington's bipartisan consensus on tougher policies towards China, including growing support in Congress for expanding support for Taiwan and Taiwan's growing independent lead with domestic politics. Two, an unplanned incident which triggers an unmanaged escalation. Yeah. This is a persistent possibility. 
Several accidental naval and media collisions, near misses and standoffs have occurred over the years. And the odds of further incidences in a congested sea space and airspace increased along with a more increased along with more frequent rival patrols in sensitive areas like the South China Sea since 2019 are all contributing. So for now, China may be willing to limit its ambitions over Taiwan to avoid the short-term risks that a damaging conflict with the US could bring. Also, a shift away from the US's strategic ambiguity, ambiguity to what some people have been calling a more managed strategic competition may help in developing mutually respected red lines, along with plenty of high-level back-channel diplomacy to, form, to enforce them. So the bottom line takeaway for business is to not think of the recent events in Taiwan as a one-off. It's, it's more the shape of things to come. Organizations should be thinking through the impacts and responses and mitigation for these kinds of escalations, because we're gonna be seeing more of these going forward. Potential for a range of business disruptions, to trade, to supply chain, sanctions and travel. It's not just about conflicts. So I hope I've had the, wet the appetite sufficiently to open the day and make way for some of the fantastic speakers who are following and the Q&A sessions. And I'll lastly say that if we're on a journey to geopolitical destinations still unknown, first and foremost, the advice for the business community is to know your specific geopolitics. Monitor the evolutionary process and the inevitable geopolitical flashpoints and shocks. <coughs> Build out your scenario planning and keep them refreshed but more comprehensively than we did for the pandemic plans developed after SARS, dusted off COVID-19. Regulatory changes and sanction regimes need to be high on the list of things that your companies pay close attention to across their entire footprint, but also their vendor ecosystems. And figure out where you're going to get your information and your data from. You can't just drink from the fire hose. You have to create your, curate the resource, your sources. Lean on your analysts, whether they are in-house or from trusted providers. If you found any of the content interesting today, we run a forecast at the end of each year, <coughs> the following year. Um, we call it Risk Map. And uh, it will be run in about November of this year. It's a free event. Um, if you're interested. Thanks very much for listening and thanks very much for attending today.